So last week, we began a new series called First Things First, where we are discussing how to seek God first with all we have been entrusted and live into the call of Matthew 6, verse 33, which says, seek first the kingdom of God. And as we do that, we're not being naive to the demands of this world and the challenges that we might be walking through, but we are being intentional to do three specific things. This is a three-week series. First, we're evaluating the competition that prevents us from seeking first the kingdom of God. Second, we're identifying the challenge before us, the challenge laid out in scripture. And then third, we're discussing the commitment required to do this well as followers of Christ. So today, we are going to focus on the second piece of identifying the challenge and looking at what Scripture says about prioritizing God above all else when it comes to stewarding our resources. So that could be your time, that could be your energy, it could be your finances, it could be your relationships, everything that we have been entrusted with by God. Before we do that, let's go ahead and pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here to worship you this morning, to remember um, just how beautiful your love is, how beautiful your grace is. We praise you for the opportunity to be here publicly, to be here within community, and I thank you for each and every person in this room. I pray, Lord, that today, as we dive into what your word says, what the challenges that you present before us to be good stewards, that it would uh, just change hearts and minds in this space. I pray, Lord, that as we think about money and stewardship and giving of our resources, that we would just push aside any feelings of awkwardness or being uncomfortable, and instead we would look to you, look at your word, and um, just look at this as a new opportunity to grow in our faith. We love you, and we honor you. In your name we pray, amen. So before we jump into the challenge that we face when we're aiming to seek first the kingdom of God, I want to review what we discussed last week uh, regarding the competition just to refresh ourselves real quick. And if you weren't at church last week, you can listen to our sermon on our podcast if you go to thetablechurch.org slash teaching. Um, And last week I tried to to do my best just to set a good stage of how we can approach generosity in a healthy way. So I would encourage you to listen to that. First, we all agreed that talking about how we should use our resources outside church is awkward and uncomfortable. So we're all starting in the same place. But we said that if something is awkward or uncomfortable, we shouldn't shy away from talking about it, but it probably means that we should spend some time there and which is why we are having this series. Second, we discussed how before we can move forward in facing the challenge before us and committing to seeking God first with all we have, we have to identify what is competing for our resources, what is competing for our time and our energy and our money and the things that we're holding on really tightly to. And we did this by looking at any thing, person, or situation, good or bad, that we have given the majority of our attention and love, or that we have begun to idolize. And so to evaluate this, we looked through a passage from 2 Kings um, chapter 17 and looked at how the people of Israel were living, where they were quick to idolize things and put things of this world before God. Specifically, we talked through four areas of identifying idols. Number one, we know that something may be an idol if the world is telling us we need it. Number two, it's something that we do in secret. Number three, we have an I know best mentality and don't trust God when we approach it. Or four, we turn good things into worthless God things and in turn become worthless ourselves. And remember, this is not just about money. It's about any of our valuable resources, our calendars, our friendships, our energy, etc. And more importantly, last week we talked about how when we do these things, we aren't obeying God who says to worship him first. But in addition to not being obedient, when we do these things, we aren't doing what's best for us. Because God doesn't put demands on us because he's mean. He tells us to seek him first because he knows what is best for us. He is a good God who made us in his image. We were made to love him first. We were made to worship him first. We were not made to give devotion to idols. We weren't made to discuss those four uh, areas that I just named earlier. So once we identify the competition that is in the way, we can surrender those things to God, and then we can do the hard work of identifying the challenge that 
is presented to us in scripture when it comes to um, what God expects from us in terms of our stewardship. So today we're going to look at three challenges that scripture gives us when it comes to seeking God first. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but this sermon is more of a teaching sermon, less of a preaching sermon, and we are just going to look straight into the word and what God says about giving today. So to start off, uh, we are going to again look at the people of Israel, and you all can turn with me in your smartphones or follow on the screen. We're going to start at 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and read verse 1 through 10. Now, last week, you'll remember that we talked about how the people of Israel had been ruled by a series of bad kings who were encouraging idol worship. And now we're picking up the story kind of where we left off, except the people of Israel, they are under the reign of King Hezekiah a good king who decides that he's going to purify the temple and he is going to get people to come back to God and to seek God first with what they have been given. So we're going to start off reading at 2 Chronicles 31, verse 1. When all this had ended, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh. And after they had destroyed all of them, the Israelites returned to their own towns and to their own property. So this part summarizes what we got at last week. First, we have to identify and remove the competition, just like the people of Israel are smashing these idols and, and tearing down these high places that they had built. First, they removed what was catching their devotion. Verse 2 continues, Hezekiah assigned the priests and Levites to divisions, each of them according to their duties as priests or Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks, and to sing praises at the gates of the Lord's dwelling. The king contributed from his own possessions for the morning and evening burnt offerings and for the burnt offerings on the Sabbaths, at the new moons, and at the appointed festivals as written in the law of the Lord. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, olive oil, and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them in heaps. Jump down to verse 9. Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites about the heaps, and Azariah, the chief priest from the family of Zadok, answered, Since the people began to bring their contributions to the temple of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare, because the Lord has blessed his people, and this great amount is left over. So the first thing we see is that Hezekiah assigned the priests and the Levites according to their duties. So if we think of this through our modern lens, the people serving on church leadership, they weren't responsible for everything. They served according to their role or according to their gifts. And they were able to do this. The temple was able to operate successfully because of what verse 4 says. The king ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due, the priests and Levites, so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Essentially, church leadership was able to devote themselves fully to God and leading in the temple because they had ample resources available to them. And that was given by the people in Jerusalem, the people who would benefit from being at the temple. Second, as soon as the order went out from King Hezekiah, the people of Israel gave generously and were cued into two ways that they did this, how they gave generously. Number one, scripture tells us that they gave of their first fruits. This means that when they looked at their income and when they looked at what they would be generating, they were determined to give back to God before they used their resources on worldly things. So giving to God, it wasn't an afterthought. It was their first thought. It was a priority. So our first challenge that we learn from Scripture when it comes to seeking God first is to make generosity a priority. But unfortunately, it is really easy to have good intentions about making God a priority. And somehow, we still forget to do it. Or when the time comes, we get really scared and we hold on to our finances and calendar and we say... God, you're a priority, but I'm going to just wait until next week or next month to, to sort of put this into action. And this is why it is so important that when we look at those resources, that we also pair that in our mind with giving God our first fruits. Giving our first fruits, it means not giving out of compulsion or as an afterthought, but when we look at our budget before we even get paid, we've already decided in our hearts how much we're going to give to God. 
It means that we look at our calendar for the month and we schedule the opportunities where we are going to commune with God and serve God before we schedule other things. So practically, this might mean scheduling your your prayer time with God before you schedule your morning workout classes or scheduling what time you're going to study the word of God before you figure out what time you're going to watch Netflix with your friends after work. Um, Or it may look like figuring out, you know, which Sunday of the month you're going to serve at your home church before you schedule those weekend trips or brunch with your friends and with your families. When we give God our first fruits, generosity is intentional, but it also becomes a natural way then of how we live our lives. The second thing we see, scripture tells us that the people of Israel, they gave a tithe. Now, a tithe here simply means a tenth. The Bible says they brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. So they not only realize that seeking God first means giving him my first fruits, but King Hezekiah gave them a number. He instructed them to give 10% of their income to the Lord. And from this, scripture tells us that we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare because the Lord has blessed his people and this great amount is left over. There were heaps left over. Tithing is the primary and the practical way that we acknowledge that God is first. Tithing is a concept that is talked about throughout scripture. Primarily, we see it in the Old Testament, and it is basically this metric that is used to respond to God's blessing. So we don't use the tithe to invoke God's blessing, but we use it to respond to God's blessing. And again, practically, when you look at your budget, if you were to practice tithing, it would mean setting aside 10% of your income and giving that to God um, or giving it to you know, a kingdom agenda. In the same way, it might mean setting aside 10% of our other resources, so 10% of your free time and, and exerting your energy in a way that honors God. Now, for some of you, 10% is going to seem like a lot. For others of you, 10% may actually be quite small, depending on what your calendar looks like or what your income looks like. And the important part here is not necessarily the number, a tenth, though that is the biblical standard that's presented to us for giving. The important part here is that when we set a percentage to be generous with, it allows us to be progressive in our generosity as we receive blessing. And it also accounts for faithful generosity during hardship or stressful seasons. No matter what your income looks like, if you have decided that I'm always going to give 10% back to God, then when you get a raise at work, you automatically know how to adjust things. In the same way, if you were to quit your job and go back to school, when your amount of free time or your income decreases substantially, you already know how to give 10% of what you have available back to God. Now, at this point, most of you are feeling a little bit squeamish, and the thought of giving 10% of your income to God is terrifying, and the new people are like, who is this lady, and why does she keep talking about money? (laughs) But based on what your budget looks like or what your calendar looks like, it may be true that it seems a little scary to give that large of amount back to God. I know that some of us are stretched really thin, and we are working so hard to make ends meet And my hope is, is that after last week, you've taken some time to figure out what the competition is, the competition for your resources, and you can just start to consider this idea of giving God your first fruits and giving God a consistent percentage of what you have been given. So if giving 10% of your time right now to God seems like too much, you can look at your calendar, you can look at your budget, look at how you're exerting energy, and after you've identified the competition, You can figure out a good and healthy place to start. We all have to start somewhere, whether that is 2% or 10%. The important thing here is not the number, but the important thing is that we pick a percentage to be generous with, and we prioritize giving of our first fruits, not of our leftovers. And when we do that, it leads to giving with intentionality and giving with heart, not out of reluctance or out of guilt. So the first challenge then is to make generosity a priority by giving a percentage and aiming to be progressive with that. Now, some of you right now, you are thinking, nice try, Pastor Jess, but that's from the Old Testament. And didn't Jesus come so that we wouldn't have to be ruled by the law anymore and by all these silly numbers? Isn't this model outdated since I don't have sheep and honey and, you know, herds to give 10% of back to God? And the answer is, well, Yes, sometimes, and also no in others. There's not an easy answer to that. 
In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus tells the religious people of the day, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus is telling us that tithing, giving 10% of our resources to God, it's not the final point. Being obedient to God is not about fulfilling some rule, but rather being obedient to God is about the posture of our heart. (laughs) Giving generously of what you have been given is not about the number. It is about what is happening inside of you. In fact, giving of your finances is important, but Jesus says that even more important are matters of, of justice and mercy and faithfulness because when we prioritize those matters, generosity is going to naturally flow through us. It's going to naturally be part of our life. We see a second model for generosity in the book of the books of Mark and Luke. It's the same story captured in both gospels that really gets at the heart posture that I'm talking about and the heart posture we're supposed to have when it comes to giving. And this model also might help answer some of the questions you all are having of, okay, then what percentage am I actually supposed to be giving? So turn with me to Mark 12, verse 41 to 44, and this is going to be from the New Living Translation. Scripture reads, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him. He gathered them around and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has to live on. This story has come to be known as the widow's might, and it's important to remember that during this time, to be a widow meant that you had one of the lowest and most vulnerable places in society. This woman, she did not have a husband to provide for her financially, but instead she was on her own in the world. And this is a story that is hard for us to swallow because it really turns our worldly perception of generosity completely upside down. Again, we are told that it is not about an amount. It's not about a percentage. This woman gave two small coins while everyone else was dropping in what the Bible says were large amounts. But somehow, this woman who gave only two small coins has given more to the kingdom of God than anyone else in that temple making contributions. By our worldly metric of generosity, this does not make any sense. But in God's kingdom, a kingdom that exists because of sacrificial love and because of sacrificial generosity, we can see the heart posture of this woman is far more generous than anyone else in that temple. The poor widow did not give out of her surplus but rather her gift was one of sacrifice. She didn't give out of what she had left over for the month, but instead she gave everything she had available and she put it in God's hands. Scripture says she gave everything she had to live on and she trusted that in God's economy, not only would her needs be met, but her generosity to the temple would bring more good to the kingdom of God than she would ever be able to create by herself. Note that Jesus doesn't mention the concept of a tithe here. He doesn't say anything about giving 10%, but instead he's getting to the point of sacrificial generosity. We are called to give sacrificially. Giving sacrificially means that it is not easy, but rather generosity challenges you in a way that results in you depending on the Lord to provide for you. Now, this concept is much more subjective than a tithe because for some of you, 10% is a sacrifice. For some of you, 5% is a sacrifice. But for others of you, 10% is is easy, right? Sacrificial giving, it's not about the metric we use to measure our generosity, but rather the heart posture required to truly live generously. So our second challenge then is to give sacrificially from a generous heart. And the easiest way to assess this is if what you are giving to God is easy for you. If you don't feel the challenge of it, it is worth reassessing and asking God to show you what sacrificial generosity can look like. 
Finally, we get to our third challenge when it comes to living generous lives and putting God first. And frankly, this is the most difficult part for me. It is an area that I don't think the church has done a good job of talking about. The church has spent a lot of time trying to convince people that generosity is about two things, loving God and loving others. Now that's true. But when we simplify it down to those two points, Sometimes the explanation of why we're generous is only externally focused. And two things happen from this. One, it runs the risk of creating guilt internally if we can't live up to this standard that's put before us. And two, it doesn't explain all of God's intentions for calling us to live generously. Now, what do I mean by that? The primary byproduct of giving generously from our heart is not about God, and it is not about others. Mainly, it is about you. And that's not because it involves your time or your money or your resources. It is about you because when we are generous, we get to experience God working through us. We get something out of it. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 through 19 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I love that line because it doesn't say with everything for our basic needs. It says for everything for our enjoyment, God will provide us with that. Scripture continues, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This passage shows us that when we put our hope in wealth or in anything that we could attain by ourselves, we are actually selling ourselves short. Instead, if we are rich in good deeds, if we are generous, and if we share, we are living into the humanity that God designed us to have. God created us in his image. He is the giver of life, the giver of salvation, the giver of all good and perfect things that we experience in this world. And when we are generous, we have the opportunity to both act in a way that God designed us, and scripture tells us that when we are generous, God will give us treasures in heaven for the coming age. Treasures in heaven. Can you possibly imagine what that, what that could mean? What heavenly treasures God could possibly have in store for us just because we've been generous with what he's given us? Don't mistake this verse or the word treasures to represent salvation. Scripture is clear in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But what this passage in Timothy is telling us is that there is more, right? There is a reward. And if you have, been, if you have ever been generous with your time or with your money or with some aspect of resources that God has given you, when you are generous and do it with a willing heart, you don't ever regret it. Right? When you see the fruits of your generosity do good, it's not really common that you then would go, oh, yeah, I wish I didn't you know, bring a smile to that person's face with the hour that I served at church. We don't, we don't do that. But we see the treasures. And I would argue that there are not only treasures in heaven for when we accept this opportunity, but part of those treasures are what we see on earth when we are generous. So often we think that being generous, it's, it's just about doing good or standing with the oppressed or feeding the hungry or giving money to X cause because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what's expected from us. But honestly, it is a gift to us when we are generous to others. And I'm going to tell you why. This is a secret, okay, one that the church does not talk about often and frankly one that most lead pastors would never be caught out loud saying but I'm going to do it anyways, and I may get an email later from the trustees that are like, Jessica, that wasn't the wisest thing to tell your congregation. But the secret is, God doesn't need your money, and God doesn't need your time, and God doesn't need your energy, and God doesn't need any of the resources that you have at your disposal. 
We worship the creator of the universe, an almighty and powerful God. He doesn't need us to fulfill his purpose. Rather, God invites us to it. God invites us to be part of something great. God invites us to a holy opportunity. God says, you know what? I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to give you two gifts because I love you so dearly. The first is if you believe in my son, Jesus, here's salvation. You don't deserve it, but I want you to have it because I cannot stand to not be with you for eternity. I love you way too much. And unfortunately, humanity is sinful and God is perfect and good. But because of that, Jesus came to make all things new and give us the opportunity to be with God for eternity. But that's not all. God says, you know what? I also love you so much that I'm going to extend another gift to you. You're invited to be part of building my church. You're invited to be part of advancing my kingdom. You, yeah, you, as imperfect as you think you are, I want you to be part of what I'm doing with your gifts and with your skills and the resources that you have. I want you to invest in the kingdom of God. And remember that God is not a selfish God. So what we see in scripture, this is not for his benefit, but this is for you. Because every time that you give with a generous heart, you will be changed. Your generosity is a mere image of God's generosity when he created us in his image. Your generosity is a byproduct of God creating us to look like him. And God says, you know what? If you need an example of this, let's look at what happens at church on Sundays. You know all the hard work, Jordan and Tim, that went into setting up this stage and setting up this space on Sunday morning? Well, during worship, I want you to turn around and look at the people that are communing with me. You had the opportunity to be a part of that. God says, you know that $236 you gave this week? Well, that actually paid for the shipment of 1,000 prayer cards. And six people last week or two weeks ago, they turned in a prayer card because they believed, they believed in the power of the prayer team praying on their behalf and lifting up their praises or their requests to God. And not only that, those prayer cards actually came from a local printer. So you automatically invested in the city that God has planted you in. You know the hour and a half that you gave to serving at Table Kids last month? Well, that wasn't babysitting, but one of those kids, they were having a rough morning and they walked in and they felt known and they felt loved. And that is a beautiful thing that you had the chance to be a part of. One more thing. You remember when you woke up early on Saturday to go serve at the food pantry after you had been out really late on Friday night? You remember? <laughs> well, God knows that there was a person there that hadn't stepped foot in church in a really long time. And they didn't just receive groceries. They received warmth and hospitality and they felt loved and accepted for the first time in a really long time. And you had the opportunity to plant a holy seed that God is now gonna water and grow. When we give generously, God loves us so much that he makes sure we get to see the fruits of it in one way or another, whether that is here on earth or one day up in heaven. When we give generously, we are not emptied, but we are filled. Consumption, that, that empties us, but generosity, that fills us, and that is a gift from God. It is an opportunity to see God at work and for our faith to grow and for our love for the Lord to grow. Generosity is not just about loving others and loving God, but it is about receiving an opportunity from God as well, an opportunity to be generous, just as God has been generous with us, and each time we do it, we get to look just a little bit more like him. And remember that God does not want something from you. He wants something for you. He is a good God. His asks of us are not self-serving, but they are out of love because he knows what is best for us. And in the same way, the church, at least our church, we don't want something from you. We want something for you because we have seen people's lives be changed when they give of their finances to holy work or when they give of their time back to God. 
Our third challenge then, the final challenge, is just to accept the invitation. Accept the opportunity to be part of what God is doing. And maybe for you, that's not here at the table church, and that's okay, right? Maybe this isn't your home church. Maybe for you, that means giving of your time to a nonprofit that has a godly agenda and serving others in your neighborhood, right? Maybe for you, that means giving of your finances to a cause that is in line with what scripture says we are supposed to invest in. Generosity, it is between you and God, but he does give us some challenges that when we follow them, he says it is for our good, it's for our well-being. And so as you go about this week and as you prepare for our final sermon next week where we talk about what it takes to really commit to this, I want you to reflect on the three challenges that we laid out today. Number one, make giving a priority. Give a percentage to God and aim to be progressive with it. Number two, give sacrificially, right, from your heart. And number three, accept that holy invitation that we have from God to be part of something really miraculous and wonderful. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for just the beauty that's found in scripture. I pray, Lord, that whenever we might be confused by it, when we are confused by what we read in your word, that we wouldn't abandon it, but that we would sit with it and that we would ask you to work on our hearts so that we might be able to come and understand you even more. I pray, Lord, for the three areas, these three challenges that we talked about today, God. I pray that folks would be excited to discover this new way of generosity, a generosity that flows from the heart. Lord, I pray that you would show them what sacrificial giving looks like, and in response, they would want to be a part of that too. I pray, God, that you would encourage them to give with a percentage of what they have, Lord, so that they can always aim to be giving to you no matter what the circumstances might be. And God, I pray that ultimately our minds would not rest on the idea that being generous has to do with our money or with our time or with any other resources that we might have. I pray, God, that instead we would look at the bigger picture and we would look at what you are inviting us to. And we thank you for letting us be a part of that. I pray, God, that as folks in this room are a part of that, that their lives would be changed. In your name we pray, God. Amen.